Um, welcome to GP Training Lockdown Learning Session 6. Um, we're going to cover today diabetes, antenatal care, and talk about post-CCT fellowships, okay? So let me get my clicker. For those that are coming for the first time, welcome. Just a brief introduction. My name is Dr. Mohib Rahman. I'm a portfolio GP based here in Birmingham and Solihull. I do a range of different clinical and non-clinical roles. I'm the medical director of eMedica. So um, I teach everything from getting into um, medical school all the way up to uh, post CCT and everything in between. Okay. Um, mostly focusing on GP training and MRC GP exams and getting people into GP training and successfully, you know, having a GP career. So the format today, we're going to teach on three topics, two clinical, one careers. It's going to be interactive. So please do get involved in the chat, involved in the poll. Uh, we're going to start with a case today and then we'll build in some AKT questions. And then we're going to do some AKT questions on antenatal care. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about post CCT fellowships. So you've already seen how to use the chat. Okay. Um, if you've got a question you'd like me to answer, please don't put that in the chat because with so many doctors, it's difficult to keep track of the chat. Please put that in the Q and A, which you'll see next to the chat, and I'll get those in the order they come. Please don't use the Q and A for chat. Use that for questions. And then you can't see a poll, but when I launch the first question, I will launch a poll. Please use that to answer the question. If you don't see a poll please just write it down on a piece of paper. Okay, don't put it in the chat unless I tell you to, because other people might still be thinking. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Just a quick update on the MRCGP exams. So the cancelled April AKT has now been confirmed. It's going to be held at Pearson View Centres in 50 locations over the UK on the 15th of July. But there are very limited spaces. So just 450 spaces and priority will be based on CCT date. So first priority will be doctors due to CCT August 2020. Next priority, doctors due to CCT by December 2020. Next priority, anyone else in ST3. Last priority, anyone in ST2. I suspect there'll be hardly any, if any, slots left for ST2s, okay, because of how many people, you know, uh, need it for CCT between now and December, okay. The Royal College have said that they're holding, hoping to hold another later summer date, but no date is set for that for anyone that couldn't be fitted into the July 15th setting. OK, so just bear that in mind. OK, at least you've got a date now. That's basically two months from now. The cancelled March, April, May CSA, the temporary assessment that's going to replace it, which will be a recording of audio and video consultations, is still not been approved by the GMC yet. The submission has been made. They're waiting for approval. Once that comes, then we'll have more details of how many cases and how they'll be marking. But they have said that they plan to mark it based on CSA domains, but a similar assessment to the old MRC GP video recordings, which um, I did when I was a trainee. They, I was the last cohort, actually. The key message, whether it's AKT or CSA, please continue your preparation, continue your revision, and thank you for giving up your evening to join me for this, because you're doing that, um, you know, by joining today, right? So let's focus today on diabetes, antenatal care, and post-CCT fellowship, and the Q&A will be the end, okay? So we start with diabetes. I'm going to start with the case today, but we'll build in some AKT style questions within the case. So if I just show you, first of all, the information, this is how the information is presented in the CSA, because I know some of you are in ST1 or ST2. You're going to sit the original CSA. OK, so have a quick look at that. OK, so that's the patient and you can see that this is a telephone consultation, all right? So I'll be the patient. Let's make a start. Feel free to type into the chat um, what you'd like to ask, okay? Anyone wanna kick us off? Okay, slight dilemma, just waiting for everyone to catch up. Right, great, so someone started us off. You know, you start off with your own introduction. So, hi, my name is Dr. Rahman, okay, and can I just confirm your name and date of birth? Great. You know, on a telephone consult, on a video consult, these are really, really important things. All right, so, yeah, my name is Jason Bourne, uh, date of birth, 27th of January, uh, 1978, okay. All right, so someone said, how can I help? Oh, Doc, um, this is a routine. Um, I, I came in for a health check last week. You know, they sent me this text message that because I'm over 40, uh, I mean, they've been asking me for a while, but I've been busy. So they said, come in for this NHS health check. I came in, you did my blood pressure, you know, measured up different things. You did a whole lot of blood tests. And then they said, uh, I had a message to say, look, the results are back. I need to call. 
So I'm calling, as in, you know, you've called me, it was booked in because you guys asked me. So I don't know what you want to tell me. So someone's asked, what's my understanding of the health check? Well, I understand that they're basically just looking to see if they can pick up anything before it gets really bad and that they just offer it to everyone over 40. And so, you know, I appreciate that I'm that kind of age. So great. So what, what, what did you, you know, what, what is it that you wanted from me, doctor? Okay, someone said that they've got some results for me. Oh, great. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's, I, I figured that because they took a whole load, the ho whole load of blood, like two, three bottles of blood they took from me. So uh, what are the results, doc? Okay, someone's asked, um, any concerns about anything? Well, not really. I mean, I, I don't like to have blood taken, to be honest. I'm a bit scared of needles. Um, but, you know, I've had it done. Uh, so can we find out about that? So what's the result? Okay, so a lot of people asking the same thing, things like, you know, is there anything you're particularly worried or any concerns? So that's been answered. So shall we move on? So someone's asked uh, a question. Do you have a family history of diabetes? No, doc. Uh, is that, why are you asking that? Is that what my results show, is it? Okay, so someone said, I've got your results, but I need to ask a few questions before we, we um, go through them, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, doc, you're, you're, you're in charge. What do you want to ask? Okay, see, quite a few people have gone straight in with the results show you're diabetic. Now, you see, it's a good idea if you're meeting this patient for the first time and you don't know the background, it'd be a really good idea to get some of that background before you go straight into the results. But also, we'll, we'll come on to in a second whether or not this patient's got diabetes in a second. So some people are asking about some symptoms now. Great. So um, I, someone's asked, am I more thirsty? Well, actually, Doc, I'm, I'm not more thirsty, no. Um, anything else that you wanted to know about? So they asked, are, are you peeing more? Actually, yeah, that... that that is a bit of an issue sometimes. Um, uh, I, I've noticed that I'm peeing more. Mostly I notice it at night because I work nights. And so sometimes what I have to do is, you know, I drop off one fare and then before I pick up another one, I go and find like, you know, like if there's a restaurant or uh, like, like, you know, somewhere I can just go and use the bathroom. Uh, and so I have to not accept the next fare. Sometimes then I lose the fare by the time I come out. Someone's asked, any weight loss? No, doc, if anything, I've put on weight actually the last uh, year or so. I think I've put on quite a lot of weight. Um, it's, you know, my job, I'm, I'm sitting down all, all the time. And then because I do nights, a lot of times, you know, like supermarkets are closed. I just grab something from a takeout or something like that, like fried chicken. So, you know, it's not, it's not great. Someone's asked, do you feel tired? Yeah, I do feel tired, doc. But I put that down to the fact that I'm working a lot of nights. You see, I always used to do day shifts. But because of family circumstances, it's easier now if I do nights because then I can drop off the kids and stuff. OK, someone's asked, what job do I do? I, I drive taxis. Yeah, so I, I tend to do nights. It's just Uber, but uh, it gives flexibility. But I mostly do night shifts. Sometimes I do the odd day after I've dropped the kids. If I you know, might do a couple of fares for an hour or two before I go and pick them up again. OK, um, someone's asked, can you give an example of what I eat for breakfast, lunch and dinner? Well, I finish nights and then I normally will grab like a burger, chip, something like that, you know, at some point in the shift. So when I finish the shift, I don't really have breakfast. I go to sleep after I've dropped the kids, I come home, I go to sleep. And then when I get up, I might have a sandwich or something for lunch. Um, and then before I go out for night shift, I sit down and have a meal with the family. Someone's asked, anyone in the immediate family got any health conditions? Um, well, my dad's got a bit of arthritis uh, in his hip, but not apart from that. Do I do any exercise? Uh, not really, Doc. Um, I, I'm sitting down a lot, isn't it? Just driving people. Sometimes if people got a lot of bags, I'm lifting them into the boot. But I, don't, I can't really afford to go to the gym. I don't really have time for all of that. Okay. Um, do I smoke? Doc, you know, I said I don't mind answering a few questions, but we, we, we're going through a lot of stuff here. I, I mean, can you not just tell me the results? Because, like, that's what I thought I was phoning for. Okay. D do I smoke? No, I don't. Uh, I'll have the odd cigarette. I don't smoke like every day, but I'll have the odd one. Um, any alcohol? Yeah, maybe not when I'm driving, obviously, but maybe on my day off, um, I'll have a couple of pints. OK, so can we move on to the results now, if that's OK? I, I don't really want to answer any more questions. I, I want to know what's going on. OK, you've, you've asked your, your, your 20 questions already. Um, 
Am I taking any medication? No, doc, you've got my records. I don't take anything at all. I mean, like if I get a headache or something, I'll have paracetamol, but nothing else. So what's the result then? Okay, so I'm going to pause you guys there for a second. See now, if someone's specifically coming in asking for results, it's a good idea that if, if you think about being person-centered, rather than saying, before I go give you the results, I'm going to ask you some questions or I need to ask, you could say, would you mind if I ask you some questions? Because you know we've not met before, it'd be useful to get some background um, but also it might help me um, you know, get a better understanding of how I can help you today so that they understand it's for their benefit and then ask. Now, if they keep asking, look, I want the results now, then at some point you've got to give them the results because otherwise they're going to feel like you're not listening to me, you're not hearing me, and then it will seem a bit doctor-centered if you keep asking more questions when they've said, because you can always, after you've explained the results, go back and give a bit more information, right? Okay, right, so someone says that, I think we can say about the results now, yeah, so what the results show, Doc? So someone said that my liver function's fine and my thyroid's fine and uh, uh, my blood fats are okay. And then there's also a test called HbA1c. What's that, Doc? I never heard of that. Okay, so we know that the FBC, the eusinase, all of that's normal, right? So what's this HbA1c? I, I don't know what that means, Doc. Someone says that the HbA1c says I'm diabetic. Okay, do other people agree with that? Can we say to this patient that they are diabetic? Okay, so a few people have said yeah, they've got diabetes, All right? Okay. Mm, okay, so let's, I'm gonna pause you there for a second and look at some of the important things in the day just to see if anybody's missed anything. Okay, so a couple of things you wanna find out about. You wanna get a bit of background, you know, what, like someone might have had symptoms, that's why they came for the test. That's not what happened with this patient. Although now that we ask, he has had nocturia, um, maybe a bit of uh, polyuria, but not, not polydipsia. He, he does feel more tired, but then he's recently started doing nights, so that could be a, a problem. No weight loss. Other things to ask about. Sometimes it can present with blurred vision or with uh, skin symptoms. So like itching, generalized itching can be an early sign of um, diabetes. Family history we asked about, diet, exercise, useful, looking at overall cardiovascular risk, looking at smoking, alcohol, important. Something I talked about, um, uh, I think last week, maybe the week before, that the detail is really important, right? So we found out that he has been feeling tired. How long has he been feeling tired for? Why is that important? Well, let's look at why, okay? Um, something else that'd be really important, he mentioned is a, a taxi driver. So I'm glad that people have asked about that. That's important. Why? Because in terms of going forward, things like whether they might need to contact DVLA, which might be important to discuss in a case like this, if they're group one or group two, it can make a big difference, um, you know, with very many different conditions, but especially with diabetes. Okay. So a group one driver is someone like you or I that drives a car or a motorcycle. A group two driver is someone that drives a lorry or bus or a coach. Now, a taxi driver is unique. Taxi driver actually has a group one license, but because they drive for a living, if you look at their license, it will say group one, okay? So our practice, we do a lot, especially my partner, does a lot of the taxi medicals for uh, Birmingham City Council taxi drivers, okay? Taxi drivers have a group one license because they're driving a car. They're not driving a bus, they're not driving a coach, they're not driving a lorry. However, because they're driving for a living, we treat them as if they're group two for the medical requirements, i.e. what the DVLA says you do for group two, taxi drivers treat them like that, but technically their dri driving license is actually a group one. And then something else really important, right, is that, of course, diabetic ketoacidosis is much more common in group one, but it does happen in group two, uh, so, sorry, type two diabetes, it's much more common in type one diabetes, but in this patient, this age, is much more likely to be type two, right? One of the things that's really important is red flags, right? Ultimately, what they're looking for in CSA is, are you safe, all right? And so red flags aren't just cancer. That's what a lot of people think of. But you can see in a situation like this, new diagnosis of diabetes, one of the things you want to exclude is, is there any risk of diabetic ketoacidosis? So asking about things like vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, confusion, would be really important to rule out rare but serious things, okay? It's very, very unlikely. But yeah, I bring you on to a question. Here you go. Okay, have a look at this question. I'll launch a poll very shortly.
Um, great. So for those that did fill the poll, um, most people picked either B or A, diagnosed diabetes and start metformin or diagnose diabetes and advise on diabetic diet. Now, something really important is to read the question carefully, right? That's exam technique. I, I know that you all know what levels of the blood tests that you know that at 48 or more, and this is 55, you can diagnose. But read this particular question. Been feeling tired for the past four weeks with symptoms of polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia. Okay, so they're symptomatic, but their symptoms are for four weeks. So the right answer is actually D. We're going to arrange a random glucose. Very few people pick that. Okay, and then arrange follow up. Why? You can't use HbA1c in someone who's had symptoms for only four weeks. All right. And so it's inaccurate for diagnostic purposes in someone who's had symptoms for short term because it's a long term measure. All right. And so in that situation, if you can't use this, if they're symptomatic, you only need one abnormal reading. But because this particular reading, while abnormal, is inaccurate because they've had symptoms for four weeks, you can't use it. Therefore, you need to do something else. So doing a random glucose would be sensible because repeating the HbA1c, you still can't use it. They've had symptoms for too short a period of time. OK, so you can't diagnose based on HbA1c in this. So let's have a look at who else. I'll open up the chat for this. Um, what other patient groups would you not be able to use HbA1c for diagnosis? You know, do I say it's not recommended as a diagnostic tool because it might not be accurate? OK. So a few people said pregnancy. Yeah. Um, if someone's anemic. Is that general anemia or any more details? OK, someone said sickle cell. All right. OK. If someone's on steroids, um, children. Short term symptoms. Yeah, that's the one from from this question. Why we couldn't use it. Um, kidney disease. Some people have said, OK. Um, hemoglobinopathies. Okay, great. So let's have a look at it. All right. So where should we not use HbA1c for diagnosis? You can't use it in children. So anyone under 18, out. Uh, pregnant or within two months of giving birth, it's not recommended. Um, someone who's been symptomatic for less than two months. So like this patient, okay, four, four, four weeks in that question. Someone at high risk of diabetes, for example, someone with family history or from ethnicities with high prevalence, like Afro-Caribbean patients or Asian patients who are acutely ill, so for example, during an admission. You shouldn't use HbA1c. If they've got medication that might raise blood sugars, like steroids, which a lot of you mentioned, okay? Um, acute pancreatic damage, including uh, surgery. And then end stage CKD. If someone's got CKD, say, you know, at the lowest levels, you can still use it. But end stage CKD, you can't use it. And then lastly, HIV infection. So all of these, you can't use HbA1c for diagnosis. Okay, right. So this is why, do you see why I said it's really important to get the detail? How long have they had those symptoms? So. If a patient is symptomatic, then with the HbA1c 48 or more, you can diagnose, okay, as long as they've had those symptoms for more than two months, and they're not in any of these categories where you can't use HbA1c. If they are asymptomatic, you need two abnormal readings on two separate dates. The thresholds, whether it's um, symptomatic or asymptomatic are the same. Random is 11.1 or more, fasting is 7.0 or more, HbA1c is 48 or more, and then OGTT is 11.1 or more. You only ever need one OGTT, even if they're asymptomatic, because that's like the most accurate test, all right? Um, but otherwise, that's the threshold, okay? Someone said, what about type one? It's the same. We're saying for this patient, it's likely to be type two, isn't it? Because of his age and uh, he's recently got symptoms. It's very unlikely to have someone develop type one for the first time, age 40 something. So in terms of management, some of the things we want to think about, we need to give them some advice on their diet and regular exercise. So the advice you should be giving to reduce their sugar intake, especially added sugars, you know, things like adding sugar to your tea, coffee, you know, um, having cakes have got lots of sugars in it and, and things like that. High fiber, low GI carbs, so um, low glycemic index, I think that you don't get a big rush of sugar and then a big drop, that release it slowly. Uh, low fat dairy, oily fish is good. Um, to avoid foods that are marketed specifically as diabetic foods, all right? They tend to cost more and be no better for you than any other food if you just careful and watch how much uh, sugar's in there. Um, to think about, even if they're smoking a little bit, to cut that down, why? Because we're looking at overall cardiovascular risk. Advice about alcohol. Again, this person wasn't drinking very much, but something that a lot of patients don't realize is that the carbs and the amount of sugar in um, alcohol 
can have a big impact on diabetes as well as adding calories, okay? And then we wanna start thinking about the long-term, okay? Things like uh, retinal screening, um, you know, a diabetic education program so that they can get, a, like in your 10, 15 minute appointment, you can touch on the basics of a diet, but it would probably benefit from an appointment with a diabetic nurse who's got more time to go through this in a lot of detail, okay? And then you could think about either a trial of diet modification. If you've got a patient who maybe uh, is overweight, but not obese, and maybe is very motivated. Um, if you've got patients who are obese, you're probably better off starting to think about starting medication at this stage, okay? Because they're already at increased cardiovascular risk. So first line would be metformin, wouldn't it? All right, um, would be first line drug to think about. Okay, let's have a look at another question then. So this guy he's mentioned is a taxi driver. Let's have a look at a question in relation to that. So um, what I can see is the most popular answers were A and D. So doesn't need to contact the DVLA, continue to drive, and then must contact the DVLA and continue to drive. In fact, the most popular answer was this one. Doesn't need to contact and can continue to drive. So again, look, remember this patient's a taxi driver. Let's say we're gonna start him on metformin because um, you know his diet's not great and he's uh, obese um, and so on, okay? So the correct answer is D. So well done, about a third of you got that right of those that in the poll. You do have to contact the DVLA if you're a, a, a type 2 driver, a group 2 driver, or taxi drivers. Remember, we treat them, although they're technically group 1, we treat them as if they're group 2. So taxi drivers also need to contact the DVLA, but they can continue to drive. Why? Because they're just on drugs. They're just on metformin. If they were on insulin, then it's a different story. Okay, so D is the right answer. So we want to advise this patient that they need to contact the DVLA if they're on tablets. If they're not on tablets, they don't need to. Okay. Um, if they're just on diet control, you know, even group one and group two, both groups don't need to contact. Um, but if they're on tablets, group two and taxi drivers need to contact. Group one and group two can keep driving. There's no restrictions if they're on tablets, okay? And you'd wanna follow up in one to two weeks to see, is the metformin being tolerated? If not, you normally would increase a dose. Because you start at a low dose, like 500 milligrams once daily, then you can increase and you can increase. What's the most common side effect that leads people to stop using metformin or say that you know they don't want to carry on because it's really distressing for them? What's a really common side effect? Someone said all diabetics must inform DVLA. That's not correct. Okay. If you're on diet control only, you, you don't need to contact the DVLA. Okay. Um, yeah, so GI symptoms are most common. So nausea, um, abdominal sort of uh, discomfort, diarrhea. Uh, these are the very, very common symptoms with um, metformin. Leads a lot of patients to you know, not want to keep taking them because they're quite distressing symptoms, okay? Right, so in terms of interpersonal, a couple of things to think about. One is to explain what type two diabetes is clearly. So feel free to type in the chat how you might explain that. They need to think about the fact that this guy might be quite worried about the fact that even if he has to contact, you might be worried if I contact them, might they stop me driving? So you could give some reassurance, actually, you're just on tablets. Most patients, you know, there's a range of different tablets. And if you're just on tablets and you're well controlled, it won't affect your actual ability to drive. You need to be aware of symptoms to watch out of, especially of hypos and things like that. Okay. Um, and it's only really if they go on to insulin that driving might be affected. But for the majority of patients, that's many years down the line or might never need to happen, especially you can use that as a very powerful tool, especially if you can be very careful about your diet and if we can work together to help control your sugars. OK, but how we might actually explain the type 2 diabetes, have a think about that. So a couple of people put some explanations in. So, yeah, so. All diabetes is about having too much sugar in your blood. OK, type 2 diabetes, what happens is that you're basically you've got too much sugar 
because your body either isn't producing enough insulin which is a, a chemical that the body produces that regulates sugars or it can't use it properly whereas in type 1 you, you don't have insulin right okay now the problem with this is these sugars can build up and as they build up and stay at high levels over a long period of time they can cause damage in different parts of the body and that can increase your risk so they can damage the heart and increase your risk of heart problems they can damage the blood vessels increase your risk of things like uh, high blood pressure you know um, they can affect the kidney they can affect different parts of the body okay so those are some of the things to think about and then you can really use that as a powerful tool that if he's really worried about impact on his job that look if we can really help you to look at your diet look at increasing your exercise cut back on your smoking reduce your risk not only will it help you with your diabetes but we can help you reduce your risk of things like heart attack and stroke which is one of the biggest things that we want to help you with okay now this particular patient had a, a raised body mass index and that's something you've got to be really careful about how you discuss what body mass index is in the first place but also about someone with a raised body mass index so that's something again that a lot of doctors i've seen uh, in the exam struggle with so how would you explain to this particular patient the raised body mass index um, so his body mass index was in the range of obesity it was over 30 wasn't it? it was 31 and a bit okay how would you bring that up in a clear way to explain it and then how would you sensitively bring it up any any thoughts on that feel free to type that in the chat again okay so someone's asking have you heard about body mass index no doc i never heard of that okay so someone said that your weight is not appropriate for your height. Someone else has said um, about that weight when compared to height is not in the healthy range um, or that bring up a chart and then go through it or um, that use what the patient said that, you know, reflect back. He said, you mentioned that your weight's gone up in the last year. You could use that. Um, someone's talked about, you know, it would be good if you could lose weight as this usually worsens the diabetes. You could ask the patient, what do they think about their weight? He'd already mentioned, right? Um, a couple other people had uh, said the calculation, kilograms divided by meter squared. See, for most patients, that's not going to mean anything. And that's a good example of something that would lead to losing marks in the interpersonal domain in CSA. Okay. Um, something else is it about sometimes people will um, say something that adds a judgment to it without meaning it. I'll give you an example. Very commonly, this is what I'll hear. Someone will say, look, if we look at your BMI, and the patient's like, what's BMI? And they say, oh, it's your body mass index. The patient's still no, no clearer, right? They'll say, well, well, essentially, it's a bit higher than it should be, or it's a bit higher than we'd like. Now, do you see what that says to the patient? You're abnormal. You're not what we want you to be. Do you see? It's a judgment. Whereas, actually, there's some really nice phrasing that people have used here that talking about healthy. Everyone wants to be healthy. Or sometimes people say it's higher than normal. Actually, in the UK, the normal body mass index or the average body mass index is to be overweight or obese. It's very abnormal to be in the healthy range in the UK. Yeah, more than half of people in the UK are either overweight or obese if we look at their categorization. So a, a nice sensitive way and then how to also clearly explain it and sensitively bring it in. Okay, for any given height, there's a range of weight that's healthy. Above or below that, it can affect the body in different ways. Now, if we look at the healthy range for your height this is the healthy range for your height and your weight falls here I, it's above that now that can have an impact in the fact that having diabetes increases your risk of having certain risks like heart problems like high blood pressure now if your weight is above the healthy range for your height that can increase those risks further so if that's something that you said yourself that you'd notice you put on some weight would you be interested if we could give you some help in terms of a diet that would help you control your sugars, but also maybe help you get to a healthier range for your height, because that can reduce your risks of things like heart attack and stroke and help you control your diabetes better. What do you think? Can you see the difference between that and saying something in a way that without realizing might actually be seen as the patient as a judgmental? That if you say it's higher than we would like it to be, or it's higher than is ideal, or it's higher than um, normal, you make them feel bad. But also sometimes if you don't relate it to what he's come for or he's phoned for, you know, uh, the, the blood results, he might just feel like if you just say out of context, oh, by the way, your BMI is this and that's in the obese category. It's like just saying to someone out of the blue, by the way, I know we've been talking about diabetes, but by the way, you're big, you're fat. 
Do you see? You're not saying it in that way. No one would be as insensitive as that. But that's what the patient has heard if you just drop it out of the blue. Was if you relate it to what they've come for and tie it in how it can actually improve their health. Do you see how that's a much more sensitive way? And it's very clear. Okay. For any given height, there's a range of weight that's healthy. Everyone wants to be healthy, but you're not judging. Do you see? So that's a, a nice way to bring that in. Okay, good. So just to I mentioned this last week, but this is again one of 100 cases that we've adapted from our CSA 100 case crammer. Um, I'm going to move on to antenatal care now. All right. Um, other things to know about diabetes for your exams. It's worth knowing the you know current guidelines for management. So what, what's first line metformin? What's next line? There's a range of drugs that you can add. What goes after that? Things like that. Okay. But also there's peripheral things like the admin, the DVLA guidelines. You know they kick in as well. I want to talk a little about about um, antenatal care now. Okay. So we're going to talk about some of the risks when someone's pregnant, and then some of the things that we might screen for. All right. Um, let's have a look at a question first of all. That's time. Thank you very much. OK, so um, I'll close that off um, so I can see that. The most popular answer uh, was C, vegetable pate. Followed by A, cottage cheese. OK, so vegetable pate and cottage cheese um, were the two most popular answers. Um, after that, it was poached eggs with a lion stamp. OK. Um, they're the probably three most popular answers that I can see. So remember, you need to get them both right. If you get one right, one wrong, you won't get a mark, unfortunately, in the AKT. So the question is asking which two of these are safe to eat in pregnancy? I suggest everything else is not safe. There's a risk attached to it. OK, which two are safe? The two that are safe are A and G. OK, A and G are considered safe. All of these other ones carry a risk of either uh, listeria poisoning or salmonella poisoning or toxoplasmosis poisoning. I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a second. So. Key thing is, this is, I just want to introduce you for those joining for the first time, those that came previously, you've seen this before, that multiple best answers, you have to get them fully right. So like this asks for two, okay? If you get one right and one wrong, you won't get any marks. You won't get half a mark. You have to get it all right. So you had to have had A and G to get the mark, okay? So the main food risks in pregnancy are listeria poisoning, salmonella poisoning, and toxoplasmosis. So listeriosis, you want to avoid ripened soft cheeses and blue vein cheeses. So things like camembert, brie, chevre is a ripened goat's cheese. Okay, Pate, whether meat or vegetable, it's the process by which pate is made that introduces a risk of listeria poisoning. So it's recommended to avoid both. Um, if I go back to the question, option C, which uh, was the most popular answer, this is what we call a distractor. A well-written question will have some plausible options that will catch people out. Like vegetable, like a lot of people think, oh, it's vegetarian, it's got to be healthy. Not everything vegetarian is healthy, okay? If I deep fry some vegetables, okay, in flour, so I've got carbs with carbs, all right, um, and, and then eat it, loads of them, like, you know, um, that, that's not necessarily healthy, right? Okay, so it, it's the fact that it's pate, not the fact that it's vegetable. That's a, a, what we call a distractor. Unpasteurized milk, that's milk that's never been treated or processed, so I direct from the farm. Um, hard cheeses, processed cheeses, um, so like cottage cheese, like cheddar, like red Leicester, like the, things like that, uh, these are all safe. And then salmonella and toxoplasmosis poisoning, things you want to avoid, raw shellfish, so things like oysters or mussels that are not cooked, raw or partially cooked meats, and then cured meats like salami. Um, Soft boiled or runny eggs, like poached eggs that are soft. Uh, if poached eggs are not runny, they're not done right. OK, you know, they should be soft. Um, they're completely safe as long as they're uh, British lion quality. And so what that means, they'll have a lion stamp on them. All right. It means that the, the 
they're not considered a, a risk, okay? Um, if you're going to eat non-lion stamped eggs, then they need to be fully, fully cooked, okay? Similarly, if you're going to eat duck's eggs or quail's eggs, they should be fully, fully cooked. They shouldn't be partially cooked. But otherwise, poached eggs with a lion stamp, they're fine. They're safe, okay? So that's some of the food risks. Let's look at gestational hypertension. Right, okay, so um, I can see the most popular answer there by a huge margin was, was D, but just under half of you picked that. After that, actually very, very even between A, B um, and E. Um, and then the least popular was C. So it just goes to show it's a hard question, right? That that much spread of opinion just highlights it's, it's a challenging question. And you know, that's the whole point why we're doing hard questions is that that's how you learn, right? So the key things are that it's 155 over 100, that, does fit into a hypertensive range, okay? Um, and then if we look at the options, the options are any time during pregnancy. So that could include, for example, um, at the booking appointment, eight, 10 weeks. Um, option B, before 20 weeks without proteinuria. Option C, before 20 weeks without protein, sorry, with proteinuria. So A, B, and C, we can get rid of. It's not gestational unless it's in 20, after 20 weeks or later. I eat someone at the booking appointment, if they've got high blood pressure, that's not the baby. It's not gestational. The fetus isn't big enough to be making changes at that point, okay? That's someone, in fact, in the first and the early part of the second trimester, uh, being pregnant tends to lower your blood pressure. So someone that's still got a high reading in the first trimester, it's likely that they already had high blood pressure and it just wasn't picked up before. It's just hypertension, not gestational. So you see, by elimination, even if you're not 100% sure, you could get rid of ABC, now you're down to D or E, and it's 50-50. If you're guessing, you're making an educated guess 50-50. So right answer is D, so well done. Most of you, you know, it was the most popular answer, actually. Most of you didn't get it right, but more of you got it right. Uh, pick that one than any other option. So um, after 20 weeks, without proteinuria. If they've got proteinuria, what is that called? That's not gestational hypertension. If, you know, someone say 24 weeks, and you pick up high blood pressure, and then you also find proteinuria in the urine, what do we call that? Yeah, that's preeclampsia, isn't it? Okay, absolutely. Okay, good. So hypertension and pregnancy. Chronic hypertension is hypertension picked up before 20 weeks gestation because that's not the baby. It's not gestational. It's just normal hypertension that hasn't been picked up. Gestational hypertension is defined as new high blood pressure after 20 weeks gestation without significant proteinuria. And then preeclampsia, new hypertension after 20 weeks with at least one of the following. So either proteinuria or other maternal organ dysfunction, so things like um, their creatinine goes up and you think, okay, their renal function has been affected, okay? Um, liver dysfunction, so AST, ALT going up uh, above, you know, the normal ranges significantly. Uh, neurological, so if they actually have a seizure, that's no longer preeclampsia, that's eclampsia, right? Okay. Uh, hematological, so um, you can get uh, some changes in the blood work. Uh, ut utero placental, so things like uh, fetal uh, growth retardation or uh, abnormal blood flow in the Doppler and the umbilical cord. Okay, things like that are also diagnostic criteria for preeclampsia. Okay, let's look at risks for preeclampsia then.
Thank you very much. So um, I can see that the most popular answers uh, are A and B. OK, so A and B are the most popular ones. All right. Um, after that, it was E. So which of the following patients would have the lowest risk? You only pick one. You know, if it's a multiple best answer and they want two answers or three, it would always say which two or which three. Otherwise, every question has only one answer. Right. OK, so the correct answer here is A. So well done. Actually, that was the most popular answer. But 60 percent of you got it wrong of those that filled in the poll. So the really tricky thing about this, this is a high challenge question is that all five of these patients have got risk factors for preeclampsia. OK, it's just a level of risk. So this lady is uh, got twins so having a uh, multiple pregnancy, twins, triplets. Uh, that's a moderate risk factor in and of itself. OK, but you see, she's otherwise not got any other risk factors. So she's it's not her first one because she's got another child. She's not had a big gap because it's a five year gap. She's young. She's 30. So she's only got one moderate risk. The fact that she's got twins. So that is a risk factor. But if you look at all of the others, they're either high risk or if you have two moderates, it's the same as having one high risk. So having type one diabetes is a high risk factor for preeclampsia. OK, this lady having a body mass index of 35 is a moderate risk. And then having had a 10 year gap or more, and it was 11 years since her last child, is another moderate risk. Two moderates equals high risk. OK, so this lady's high risk because you've got two moderate risk factors. Having a history of preeclampsia puts you at very high risk. OK. Um, this lady probably has the highest risk. OK, and then this lady is 40 and being 40 plus, you know, that's a, a risk factor. And then having your first child, being pregnant with your first child, that's also a risk factor of moderate risk. So again, she's got two moderate risks making a high risk, two moderate risks making high risk, a very high risk, a high risk. And this patient's got just one moderate risk. So that's why they're the lowest risk. It's not that they have no risk. They're not even low risk. They are moderate risk. But you see, lowest is a relative term. So that's a very challenging question. OK, so if we look at risk factors for preeclampsia, um, high risk. So if you've got any one of these ones, you're high risk just in and of itself. So um, history of having, uh, you know, hypertensive disease in a previous pregnancy, like gestational hypertension, like preeclampsia in the past. OK, having chronic kidney disease, um, autoimmune disease, being diabetic, doesn't matter if it's type one or type two having chronic hypertension, um, having thrombophilia, all of these are high risk on their own. Moderate risk factors. So if you have any one of these, you're at moderate risk. But if you have two or more of these, you're considered high risk. So first pregnancy, being 40 plus, having more than 10 year gap between your last child, body mass index of 35 or more, um, having a family history of preeclampsia. You can see if you've had preeclampsia yourself, it's high risk. Family history of preeclampsia, it's a moderate risk. And then having a multiple pregnancy, twins, triplets. Okay. OK, last one, I think it's the last question, uh, and then we'll talk about careers for about 10 minutes um, and then we leave it there. OK, so I'll stop it there just for time. Um, so two answers that were very, very similar proportion are A and B. OK, um, in fact, A, B were very, very close. And then after that, it was C. All right. Uh, very few people picked D or E. So the key thing is that this lady's body mass index is 30.2. So I, it's above 30. All right. Otherwise, the blood pressure is OK. No recorded past medical history. She's young. Nothing else uh, of note here. OK, the correct answer is D. Um, hardly anyone picked that. So because of this body mass index, she falls into a high risk category for having a baby have neural tube defects. And so she needs the higher dose of folic acid, which is five milligrams. So generally we prescribe that because if you buy it over the counter, you're going to get 400 micrograms. That's the standard dosing. OK, so anyone with increased risk, you give them five milligrams and you take that. So you start that now, she's actively planning, you, you take that pre-pregnancy up until 
the end of the first trimester. So up until week 12 or so, you should take the folic acid. And then vitamin D is 10 micrograms, but that's during the whole pregnancy. In fact, if you're breastfeeding, you should also take it during uh, breastfeeding is recommended. But you don't start taking vitamin D pre-pregnancy. You don't take that. It's not a pre-pregnancy hormone like uh, folic acid is. Okay, so D is the correct answer. She needs high uh, dose because of that body mass index. So which other patients would need high dose folic acid? Um, put that into the chat. What other patient groups would be prescribed five milligrams daily of folic acid from when they're starting to actively try to get pregnant up until the 12th week or the end of the 12th week? So first trimester, basically. What are the other patients with a high risk that you might think about? So someone said diabetes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone says... Uh, someone with epilepsy actually only if they're on anti-epileptic medication which of course most people with epilepsy would be but yeah it's, it's about being on the medication is the key okay um past history yeah of neurotrophic defect absolutely um celiac disease yeah a lot of people missed that one okay good great fantastic so yeah absolutely so folic acid is a pre-pregnancy hormone you take it from before you start up until the end of 12 weeks the standard dose is 400 micrograms people can buy that over the counter People with increased risk, we give them five milligrams. So who are they? Past history of having a child with neurotube defect. Obesity, so body mass index 30 plus. This is one that a lot of patients fall into and a lot of people miss. Diabetes, sickle cell, um, celiac, someone had mentioned, uh, taking anti-epileptic medication. And then vitamin D, you take that during pregnancy and then during breastfeeding as well. Okay, great. And then just one last one, just for the chat. I'm not going to launch a poll for this. Um, what, what about patients that we might screen for gestational diabetes. Do we screen everyone? Do we only screen people who are at risk? If so, who do we screen? Or should we screen everyone for gestational diabetes? So people have said, uh, if they're an Asian patient, uh, previous gestational diabetes, um, previous uh, large baby. Um, everyone, a few people have said everyone, okay. If they're overweight, Okay, lots of people saying everyone. Okay, that's interesting. I might make a, a question out of that one for later. Thank you for the idea. Okay, good. So let's go through it. Um, actually, we covered this in one of our clinical case cards. So we only screen patients at high risk according to the current NICE guidelines. You don't screen everyone. Okay. Um, who would we screen? Body mass index of 30 or more. So not overweight, obese. Okay, so 26 is overweight, for example. You wouldn't screen them. Previous macrosomic uh, infant, a large baby, four and a half kilograms or more previous gestational diabetes, family history of diabetes in a first degree relative. So that's, you know, like mom, dad, brother, sister, things like that. Family origin of high diabetes prevalence. So South Asian origin, Caribbean family origin, Middle Eastern family origin, for example. And then the test of choice is the oral glucose tolerance test, isn't it? Because of the fact that HbA1c is not accurate. And the threshold, though, is 7.8 for gestational diabetes. Whereas what's the threshold? Remind me, we covered this earlier. I just want to check that you're paying attention. What's the threshold on an OGTT for diagnosing normal diabetes, not gestational? What's the figure? Yeah, that's right. It's 11.1. .1, okay. Um, but for gestational diabetes, much lower, 7.8. All right. Okay. So that's one of 112 topic reviews in our clinical case cards. I, I know a lot of you already got those from last week and the week before. Right. I'm, I'm going to just talk about careers. Just before I do, I just tell you about, we just launched this last week, our AKT Pass Plus online package. We run these as physical courses. We already ran it, for example, in March for people who are planning to sit the April exam. Uh, we're not going to run the physical courses um, again for the July exam, but we have the online one. Okay. So it's a total of 100 plus hours of learning, including 20, more than 26 hours of videos. OK, so we've got our AKT masterclass. Now, all of these, by the way, are available separately if you just want one part of it. But as the bundle is hugely discounted. OK, so that's a two hour webinar OK, on how to approach, why people fail, how to avoid it. Our AKT preparation course, eight modules, including a full mock. Um, covers all three domains, uh, stats, admin, clinical, big emphasis on up-to-date guidelines and developing exam technique. Statistics webinar, three hours covering all the key stats topics. Organizational webinar, all the key admin topics in three hours. Um, high yield clinical examiner, all the high yield clinical topics from the last 10 years worth of exams, examiner's reports in three and a quarter hours. AKT 200 question mock grammar, full day course recording, 450 question mocks, making a full 200 question mock. 
online revision questions, 1,700 questions, including a full mock, and then another full mock. So you can subscribe from anywhere from a month to 12 months. And then we've got a code LOCKDOWN6, which will expire at the end of May. That will give you 15% discount on any of our online stuff, online courses, webinars, and so on. Okay. Something else, I just want you all to save the date if you're planning to sit in July or the later summer sitting. The Royal College has asked me to run a half-day AKT course for them okay, via live stream. So it's going to be on the 13th of June for the whole afternoon from 1.30 till 5.45. Okay. So just over four hours. There'll be a couple of short breaks in there, but there'll be like three and more than three and a half hours worth of actual CPD. Um, it's going to be just £50 because the Royal College asked me to run it at essentially at the absolute lowest cost we could possibly do it for um, to help people who are preparing for July or the other summer sitting. So we're going to cover key topics from admin, stats and clinical. There'll be a teaching mini mock exam, a chance to develop exam technique and consolidate knowledge. One of the things we're going to cover is why people fail based on research over the last 13 years, both from the examiners and our own research. But also we've been doing research on the habits of people that score in the top 5 10%, the habits of high performers. If you can emulate those, you increase your chances. Now, the bookings aren't open yet, but they're not going to be through our website. These are all going to be direct with the Royal College. I just wanted to tell you about the date so you can keep that in mind because the Royal College hasn't actually developed the mechanism to book yet. And I'm going to be on leave the next two weeks, so I won't be able to send out emails and things. Okay. Um, so just watch out for that. It'll be directly on the Royal College website on the 13th of June. The date's confirmed now. The time's confirmed. What we're going to cover is confirmed. Um, and once they send me details of the link, you know, when I'm back from leave, I will send out details. Okay. So that's that. Watch out for that. And I'm going to talk about post-CCT fellowships. Okay. So um, just five minutes I'll spend on that because I can see we're nearly at time. I'm going to talk about post-CCT fellowships. So um, when you qualify, there's lots of choices and we've talked about partnerships, locum, portfolio, salaried, okay? Well, one of the things that you might have read about is in England only, these new two-year post-CCT fellowships, but in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, there are also existing some one-year post-CCT fellowships. These are all optional. Essentially, what happens in a fellowship is that part of the uh, salary is funded by Health Education England or, you know, um, Education Scotland or NIMTA, which is the training organization in Northern Ireland um, and so on. OK, so essentially you typically get one session a week paid CPD and you get mentorship from an experienced uh, GP trainer. For current trainees that are going to get CCT in 2021 onwards, you'll all be offered an option of a fellowship. You don't have to take it. From 2021 onwards, people starting training, they'll automatically be enrolled from ST1. They'll be enrolled in a three-year training and a two-year fellowship. They can opt out, but it will be there for everyone if they want it. Um, especially for international graduates, one of the big advantages of this is it will give them a chance to get a five-year visa. So at the end of this, they'll automatically be eligible for ILR. Okay. Now, some fellowships are already available. And I was looking today before this webinar. I saw that, for example, the different fellowships out there, they tend to have themes. So some will be based around leadership. So you've got your clinical work, but some of that time that you're going to have is going to be around learning about how, you know, CCGs and health boards are managed, leadership type, type things. Some are about health equity. So they're in deprived areas and trying to improve the flow of doctors that want to go to areas that are under doctored to improve uh, sort of health outcomes. Some are about developing clinical interests. So maybe you've got a specific thing that you want to develop more expertise in to later on develop a specialist interest. Some are academics, you're going to spend some time doing research and some are medical education based, you're going to spend some time doing teaching. Okay. So two really common questions I get asked about fellowships. Are they mandatory? No, all fellowships are optional. You could just take any other job that you want. Okay. And then another thing, and I appreciate the name is confusing. A lot of people ask, if I do a fellowship, will I get Fellowship of the Royal College. So when you finish GP training, you'll have membership, MRCGP. Okay. Will I get FRCGP? You will not. Okay. FRCGP is a recognition of significant contribution to general practice. You have to have minimum five years post CCT experience and then be nominated by an existing fellow and two existing members. Then that gets uh, assessed by the local uh, council and then it goes to the National Royal College Council. And only if it passes all those steps, then you get fellowship. So like, I got fellowship last year for my work in humanitarian medicine in promoting GP careers and medical education over the last 15 years. Okay, and I'm hugely honored to, to get it. There's lots more people more deserving than me. And it was fantastic. I met lots of people there that actually had 
come to one of our courses 10 years ago, and we're now partners doing various other things, had really interesting careers. Always makes me so happy to see that, that seeing our alumni do well. So that's FRCGP. This is not that, okay? You, you, you're not going to get any qualification at the end of this automatically. It may well be, if you do a medical education-based fellowship, you might, as part of that, do a postgraduate certificate, but then you'll need to do your project to get that. If, for example, you're doing a clinical-based one, you might then choose alongside this in your own time to do a postgraduate certificate or a diploma or a master's, and then that might lead to a qualification after a couple of years. But the fellowship itself does not lead to any qualification. Okay, so that's just something just to be aware of. I just wanted to highlight that. Okay, great. So any questions, put them in the q and I'm just going to do the summary so that those that need to leave can head off and then I'll stay back for five, 10 minutes. Um, and, and just before we go though, I remind you of the code lockdown six, all lowercase, no space. Um, but I just want to tell you, I'm going to be on leave from tomorrow morning and I won't be around for the next two weeks. So I cannot send out the video like I normally do, but it will be uploaded automatically to our YouTube channel. So please subscribe. You'll see the link. Uh, it will be sent to you when we exit the webinar. There's no sessions for the next two weeks. I'm going to be on paternity leave okay, um, for the next two weeks. And I'm going to be completely off work because I need to give time to my family. Okay. Um, the next session will therefore be the 3rd of June 2020. OK, um, and I'll launch and the, the bookings for that um, at some point um, and send you links for that. But, you know, there might be a slight delay because I'm, I'm just not going to be uh, in the office at all for the next two weeks. OK, so thank you very much. Lots of people saying congratulations. Thank you so much. So please, please. I'm quite nervous about it all with coronavirus. Uh, please uh, pray for us that, uh, you know, my wife stays safe and that the baby is safe, please. OK, uh, we're going in tomorrow. All right. Uh, so. I just want to leave you with this from Napoleon Hill. Patience, persistence and perspiration make an unbeatable combination for success. You've all been very patient while you've been waiting to find out about the exams. And those of you for AKT, you have a date now. Those of you for CSA, I appreciate you still being patient to find out the details. You've kept going. You've Some of you have joined all six of these. You know, you've kept going and you've still been doing work alongside, doing some questions, doing some practice cases, doing some reading. And now this is really important perspiration. Those of you that have got a date for July now, you know you're going to sit it then. Two months is not long. You need to really kick it up a gear now and get yourself sweating. You need to be doing lots of questions, lots of reading. Those of you that are planning for uh, CSA in, you know, the CSA replacement in July, you should already start practice video recording and audio recording some consultation. Just at least you can listen back with your trainer and get some feedback and start consolidating your knowledge of guidelines and things so that you know what you're doing so that you, you give your best impression on that record. OK, so thank you very much for all of you leaving. I uh, hope to see you in two weeks time. OK, um, I'm going to have a, it won't be a break, but a break from teaching uh, you know, to spend more time with the family. So please do pray for us. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you giving up your evenings and joining me. Um, prepare and you will succeed. Thank you so much. OK.